Good to see you tonight. We are thankful that we can gather tonight together. This will be the last time we gather on a Wednesday night together till the new year. So we will take advantage of our time. John and I plan to go about an hour and a half. If that's that's right. all right with you. We've got to make up for it. Uh, if you have not gotten a sheet, I think I got everybody one. But if you haven't gotten one, there's a few out there in the back. And we're going to get into invest again. Uh, let's start with, some, with prayer together. Father, we praise you for the opportunity to study your word and to think about such big things as the mission that you've given us. And God, we pray that those of us that have gathered here in this room, we will be more inspired, more motivated, um, clearer on what you've called us to do individually and as a church, as a whole. And God, we pray for those that, that uh, are part of this body that, that aren't with us in this room, but, but certainly are with us in spirit. And we pray that uh, we would continue to unite around your mission. God, we thank you so much for giving us clarity in your word of what you want. Help us to understand tonight and make the application in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So we have come to a, we've come to the point where we've gone through these four terms, learn, worship, connect, invest, and briefly let me remind you where we've, where we've gone through that progression. To learn the gospel, we want every single person that we meet, everyone that joins this family, to know that we want to learn the gospel. We want to make sure we are gathering to worship and living a life of worship. We want to connect to one another so we can help and encourage one another and, and prod one another to continue to follow Jesus. And of course, that connection goes vertically as well, but what we're talking about there is the connection to the body. And then we believe that out of that, it's, it's going to come. It's, it's going to come right after that. We're going to want to invest. It's not like uh, we've got to sit there and think, well, we need to invest. If I learn the gospel more and more and more, and I connect to his people and I worship God, I have to tell somebody about Jesus. And so we're going to get into that a little bit more tonight. Uh, remind you at the beginning there, um, at the top of our sheet, the the mission st or the vision statement that has been crafted by our leadership. We strive to be a family who makes disciples of Jesus Christ and plants churches to the glory of God. And those critical terms there are family. We want to be a family. We want to make disciples, which is what we're going to talk about tonight, and plant churches as well. Uh, last week, we, we talked about the mission. I think I jumped over that one, didn't I? Okay. Last week, we talked about the mission, and disciples of Jesus invest in the mission. That's what we do. We invest in the mission of Jesus. And we looked at Matthew chapter 28, and I'll read that again. This is just kind of rolls off for those of us who've grown up around church pretty easy that we're going to say, hey, we're going to Matthew 28. But as I reflected on our discussion last week, we got together and talked a little bit more. We talked with some of our other ministers on staff. Um, a couple of our shepherds um, popped into our staff meeting this week, and we were talking, and it was evident to me that you can't talk about this enough so that God can really clarify what he means in the mission. And so we don't want to just jump right past this and say, oh, everybody knows what we mean when we say make disciples in the mission. Let me read it, and then I want to ask John to kind of talk a little bit about what do you see when you see Matthew 28? Really, what is the mission? So Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. 
So for me, um, as Chip and I were talking this week, the, the way I grew up, and I think this may not be true necessarily at College Side, I think it's true of a lot, of many churches, let me say it that way. When we think about making disciples, we think about that first piece, going and baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And that's certainly an, an indispensable part of the process, right? We want people to do that. We're convicted about that. We want to be convicted about that because we think it's right. Um, but, but that second piece is really where I think we see maybe a different layer to discipleship, and that's teaching them to observe all that I have commanded. And there are two words that stand out to me. Obviously, the first word's teaching, right? Teaching them to observe. The second word is all. Hmm. Anybody doing all that Jesus commanded? Anybody here? Because I'm not. Anybody? Any takers? <laughs> so teaching stands out to me because certainly it's a part of discipleship that, that happens or occurs after a person is baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so I think historically our mission strategy as a whole church, church is, again, not necessarily talking about college side, has been to unlock our doors mm. and to get people to come to an assembly where we hope after they come enough, they get baptized. And that's kind of it. Um, discipleship, making disciples, extends a lifetime after that. And it, it really, I think, Jesus encapsulates that. I think he knows that about us and about even that first audience when he says, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded. Now, now the, th the reason that all is important is because if all of us here who are in person on a Wednesday night or if you're watching uh, online, I'm going to make the assumption that you're doing a lot of what Jesus commanded. But that word all, if, if, we, if we start where we're at and our goal is to get to all, which should be the goal, uh, should be something we strive for every day for the rest of our lives, then that means it's a progressive thing, hmm. right? That, that, that means that the starting point matters and everybody has a different starting point. So that means the discipleship process is, is a progressive kind of thing that is dependent on where a person starts. And where a person starts is incredibly important. When we talk about discipleship, do you picture this um, kind of static thing that discipleship is? So, you know, back decades past, it was door knocking in the Joel Miller film strips. If you've been in the Church of Christ, Lloyd's giving a thumbs up. You know what I'm talking about. If you don't, they were really excellent film strips, <laughs> right? Uh, that that you, would, you would knock on somebody's door and you would sit on their couch and you would, you would show them this video about why they need to be saved. And that was discipleship. That was evangelism. And I, certainly we don't, we don't view it that way now, but, but I, think, I think it's fair to say that when we picture discipleship, we picture one or two or three things and that's it. Mm -hmm. And we mean evangelism, but, but this whole idea of coming alongside somebody and teaching them to observe all that Jesus has commanded, mm -hmm. that's not just for the apostles. And that's not just for church leaders. That's, that's for everybody. That's, in fact, that's a part of the discipleship mm -hmm. process. So that's what sticks out to me. And as you're talking, I'm looking at those words and that phrase, teach them to observe all things. There's another word that jumps out to me because what in our discussions, we were talking this week, I think it was Monday, we were talking and, and we're like, okay, if I serve someone, I get involved in serving, that's missional. And it is, isn't it? I'm, I'm going outside of me and I'm thinking that way. And I should say it could be. It could be. I can serve and not be missional in the sense of Jesus Christ, can't I? And then I can serve in the sense of 
making it about Jesus. I could go help somebody, and it could not be about Jesus. It could just be, I'm just helping somebody, or maybe, worst case scenario, it could be about me. You know, it could be my mission uh, to glorify myself. But I think when I hear that, that, that term, teaching them to observe, what I want to do is I want to help someone do what Jesus commands, which certainly is serving, but it's also living like him for me personally as a husband, father, employee, friend. Yeah. I mean, there's a whole lot of things in my life sure. that I need to learn. I was talking to my buddy Willie Franklin yesterday. I talked to him about once a month or so, and, and I was thinking about this, this process, and he was, we were tossing around ideas on discipleship, and, and I just told him, I thank, thank you for showing me things that I hadn't seen before. And, and, you know, you've got people along the way that have shown you Jesus that you didn't see in someone else, and it's nothing against that other person. It's just they, they showed you a little bit more, right? And my, I've got the best dad in the world, but my, my dad is still a human being. He couldn't show me everything, you know? And there were times in my life where I needed somebody else to step in and show me something that maybe I wasn't even open to see in my dad. And then he came along and he showed me kind of how, to, how he did life with his family. And I went, oh. And really, he was teaching me to observe more of what Jesus had commanded. And so I, I thought it was really important after we had the discussion, I was like, man, we need to break that down a little bit more. For sure. What is the mission? The mission is being a disciple maker. We invest in the mission by being a disciple maker, or you can say it the other way around, by making disciples. That's what we mean. That's what Jesus means. It's not simply about holding a Bible study. It is about holding a Bible study at some point, because Jesus is going to come up at some point. But it's not simply about holding a Bible study. It's teaching to observe all things. Got anything else there? Well, you know, we, we've... You've probably heard teaching at some point in the past on that word go. You know, as you go is, is really what Jesus is getting at in Matthew 28. As you go, make disciples, baptizing them. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be this real intentional thing like we view sometimes. Uh, I think the same thing could be said about teaching them to observe all. Um, there is, we're going to get to this, and I don't want to take everything we're going to say in the next, you know, 30 minutes right now, but... But there is this sense that every relationship you have is an opportunity to teach something. Sometimes that means you're explicit. Sometimes you're not. Um, but as you go, in some way, through your career, through what you do, through the relationships that you have, you know, uh, the relationships in your, in your own family, in your neighborhood, in your job, you're going to have an opportunity to, to say something as you go. And we're going to get to that in a minute. That's good. So the, the next thing there on our sheet, what does it mean to make disciples? We left some room there for you to maybe jot down some notes. Uh, just thinking about that, spelling that out a little bit more. It's, it's bigger, isn't it, than, than simply evangelism. It's bigger than simply having a Bible study. It is teaching to observe all things that Jesus commanded. And what I meant earlier was... If I'm going to serve, it could be about Jesus or it might not be. There's some intention. There's ascending. So at the beginning of what Jesus said, he said, go and make disciples. He sent me to go do. So if I'm doing something and it's not about him sending me, then it's somebody else's mission. It might be my mission. It might be my school's mission or or whatever it may be, and, and I have slipped into that myself. I'm sure you have too. We're all human beings. We get into our own little missions sometimes. And then we go, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> is this about Jesus, or is it about something else? It might be a matter of the heart. I might not have said anything about Jesus yet. It might be first that he has sent me, so it's me with that intention. But at some point, at some point, his name's going to come up. At some point, his his family is going to come up, and so we're going to talk about how uh, next. So we're going, to, we're going to list six things here and just talk through them 
And there's probably more that you could come up with, but this would be a starting point at least. An easy way to remember this, the three T's, time, treasure, and talent, will be the first three. And I get kidded because I love that kind of stuff. I like the alliteration. <laughs> I'm old school that way. But that appeals to me to remember that. Sure. John does not go that route. <laughs> That's why he's a better preacher. Yeah. So first, time. Um, I heard that 86,400 seconds are in your day, and I heard a really good illustration about that. So 86,400 seconds. That's how many you got today. 24 hours. You can do the math real quick. Make sure I'm, I'm right. 86,400. If you took that and made it money, Last week we talked about the pennies. Uh, if you made them pennies, so you got $864 in, in your wallet. Mm -hmm. And I gave you $864 today. You got that $864, you can do whatever you want with it, but the catch is you can't save it. Mm -hmm. um, you're going to lose it. After, the, after we roll over to the next day, you're back to $864 again. It's not you know, doubled. What would you do with it? What would you do with $864 if I gave you that? Brandon, if I had that kind of money to give it to you every day, you know, what would you do with it? You could spend it. That's an obvious thing. You can go out and spend it and buy you a new coat or something. I don't know. Uh, buy you something. You can save it, but we said, no, that's off the table. You can't save it. Or you could do what we're saying here. What are we saying? Invest. You can invest it. Not this is a stolen illustration, but I thought it was really good. I thought, what would I do? Well, where would I invest it? I try to find the best place that I can invest it, invest it in, so that it would grow monetarily somehow. Because that's the truth about our time. Think about our time today, the time you spent today. Did you spend it, or did you invest it? If you spend it, it's just gone and. There's no value now or maybe tomorrow or the next day. Um, I had time. I, I ate dinner with my, my children tonight in the cold, and we sat and we ate. It wasn't very much time. We, we didn't have a whole lot of time. Wednesday night is kind of quick, isn't it? Did I spend that time or did I invest that time? Um, we had time today that we spent doing our work uh, together as a staff and and working on what we're going to do tonight or thinking about envision did we invest that time or did we just spend it and if you think about it that's that's a that's a huge resource that i've got that you got every day that we can use in the mission or or not talent okay so the next one talent time and talent okay you've got talents i do um, we've got different kinds of talents what do you have we're right next to Tennessee Tech University. We're, we've got people that are learning a little bit more about themselves in this phase of their lives, and they're going to take those talents and go use them all over the world, who knows where. And they've got a choice. They can take those talents and invest them into something that really matters, or they can take those talents and, and they can invest it. It will invest in another mission uh, that may be about them or about something else. Think for a minute about your own talents. I can look around the room and I can see talented people who have abilities and backgrounds and experiences. And those of us who are wise have learned how to use yeah. our talents the right way. Um, sorry, Joey, I'm going to pick on you. You just came in. Um, you and Kelly, both, this goes for both of you. Uh, talented athletes. You know, you've got people that have, are athletic that use their talents on the basketball court and know, knew how to do that, still know. Uh, but did I take my talents and invest them or to take them and spend them? Um, I can spend them and they're gone, or I can invest them. And I think about uh, somebody like that, I think about how those talents can continue to be used for the kingdom. I mean, how many relationships... I mean, your, your spouse, I guess, uh, you met through the, through the game. Um, but you make relationships that, that come about through those talents. What about in the business world? Same thing. Mm. 
How many relationships you can build through your talents? Jesus was a carpenter. For sure. I think sometimes we confuse our careers as our talent. And, and maybe your career is. It's very, certainly it's possible for many of you it, it is. Mm-hmm. But I think when we limit our talent to our career, we, we miss the invest piece. Right, yeah. um, you know, maybe Casey's a teacher, uh, and, and certainly that's her talent. Um, but that's not her primary talent. Her primary talent is people. That's right. And, yeah, and, yeah. and loving people. Um, and so if she views her talent as just being a teacher, then it's mm-hmm. kind of encapsulated in that. Mm-hmm. But if she goes, you know, down a layer, I guess, or, or up a level, it's, it's, it's bigger than that. A school teacher is a role where you can right. take your talent and put That's it right. in there and it works. That's right. The talent's bigger. That's good. Yeah, so, so I, I believe that God's make, wanting us to think and stop and think, how can my talents be useful to the kingdom? And what we've got to do is we've got to get outside the box of, well, here's elder, preacher, Bible class teacher. That's it. You know, <laughs> that's all you can do. Mm-hmm. That's the kingdom. And, and Jesus didn't say that in Matthew 28, did he? He didn't say these, like, there's these roles in the church house that you fulfill, and that's, that's the only way you can use your talents. Um, what we just said was, as you go, you make disciples and teach them to observe all things. How can I invest my talents into other people to help them? And that can be all over the place. Uh, the third one here, treasure. It does matter where my money goes. <clears throat> the Bible is very clear on we have the opportunity to use our financial gifts. Um, God gives to us so that we can give. I thought it might be helpful tonight quickly to just help us think about where our money goes when we share that money here as a family. So we put our money in the boxes on, as we exit or we, you know, we give online and that money goes into, into a fund and, and then the elders say this is how we're going to allocate those funds. Are, is that money being invested in the mission? It's a great question, isn't mm-hmm. it? I think we should ask that question. And I think we should hold ourselves accountable to that. If it's not, probably want to give your money somewhere else. You know, um, you want to find a way where the Lord can use it. It's exciting to me, um, since I get to see a lot of that, where, where those monies go, it's exciting to me to know that it really is being useful. It really is going somewhere. Um, it's probably no secret that a big chunk of the money that we give goes to this building and keeping the lights on and, and uh, the function, functionality of the things that happen here. So that would hold us accountable to if there are things they're using this building, they better be about Jesus, you know? And if they're not, we should stop and go, wait, wait, <laughs> why? Mm-hmm. Um, John and I were laughing how there's been a couple times uh, in the last couple years where we've pushed each other to, hey, that event's happening. We need to go in there and say something, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and the shepherds, give them credit, they've, they've pushed me to say, if there's an event from outside group that comes in, we need to go in and say, hey, welcome. We're glad you're here. Well, let me tell you something about this church. Let me tell you about Jesus. At minimum, right? Now, the truth is, most of the things that happen in this building, they've got that happening anyway. But there are groups that use this building from time to time. Um, Friday night, there's a, a, a group from Tennessee Tech, nurse practitioners. The first group of nurse practitioners will graduate Tennessee Tech history this Friday night. Well, Saturday and Friday is their hooding ceremony and they didn't have a place to do it because COVID situation there's just not good spacing so the 50 folks are going to do what this they're going to spread out in these chairs and they're going to come here and be hooded here to say um, I've gone through this program and what's exciting to me is they know who we are and we talk to them about our mission 
And I told the leader of it, the reason we're going to do this is because, because Tennessee Tech is our primary outreach to tell them about Jesus. And so we're hopeful that that kind of connection goes somewhere. You know, that's why we do what we do. But secondly, you know, the, the biggest uh, budget line in our budget is staff. You know, the, the staff that we support through this church. So your money is going to that. Um, and hopefully the staff is, is about Jesus, right? <laughs> is making disciples. Uh, yeah, they are. And then the, the, the third big one is our missions, our out, outreach in the sense of the money that we send out outside of this community, outside of this church, the people that we support. There are missionaries that we support. There are efforts that we support. We send folks out. And so those are the three biggest budget lines that we have, and um, we need to keep growing in that. But that's why the Lord told me to give, but also I want to know where it's going. And, that, and that's healthy, isn't it? For sure. So um, the fourth one, real quickly, we'll talk about this a little bit more in a moment, influence. The reason we put this one is, what if I think about I have a right to invite? I like that phrase. If I'm going to invite someone to the fellowship, to the assembly, to Bible study, to core group, to discipleship group, or invite them to have a discussion about Jesus, I probably need to have a right to do that. If you don't know me, I'm probably going to get, need to get to know you. So my influence matters. So if that's true, if I have poor influence in this community, I probably don't have a very good right to invite you to anything, and you probably don't want to be part of it. And so it matters, doesn't it? And I think about, you know, in each one of in our roles, what does the community think about me? My community, my, the people around me. Right. I don't know everybody in this community, but what, when the people think about Chip, what do they think? That matters. Yeah. It really does matter. And I want to have a reputation that would invite people. Um, and we want to do that together individually. So our influence matters. The fifth and sixth are words and prayers. And, and, and I'm passionate about all these things, but, but really passionate about the fifth and the sixth. Um, one of my favorite, it wasn't my favorite as a, just until recently, really. Um, we're doing acts in, uh, on the online Wednesday night thing right now. And, and I'm, I made a connection. I think the Lord kind of put something on my heart that, that hadn't been there before, uh, really about both these things, but primarily about that fifth one. How does a, a disciple of Jesus invest? What's the takeaway for you? How, how do I go invest in the mission of Jesus? Well, you work through those first four things. Eventually, you're going to get to number five. Mm -hmm. um, or you haven't completely invested. Yeah. In Acts chapter 3, uh, the apostles are just doing their thing. Um, they're healing people, you know, certainly they're, they've got this direct connection that, that, that we might not have in terms of the, the, the verbal word from the Lord audibly in their ear, but they're just going about doing their life. They're living their life, and they heal this um, lame man. Well, then they get called on the carpet by the same guys that executed Jesus Christ just, you know, a couple of weeks earlier. Um, so that all happens in Acts chapter 3. And then in Acts chapter 4, um, as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple, the Sadducees came upon them greatly annoyed, which is fantastic, because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. So there's this connection where the apostles aren't talking like audibly about the resurrection from the dead. They do a miracle, and then people are like, why did you do that? <laughs> And when the question, why did you do that, is asked, they say, let me tell you about Jesus Christ and the resurrection from the dead. Mm -hmm. it, it's not like investing is not primarily in really maybe or maybe a few circumstances in life where it would be this. It's not carrying a sign on the side of the road. And it's not beating people over the head about Jesus. And it's not being super explicit initially. What it is, is living life in such a way that it annoys the, the world. <laughs> like, that's what it is. Like, Christianity, from the perspective of the world, is annoying. 
And it should be, because it doesn't make sense to them. And so the world is greatly annoyed, so they ask the guys, what are you, what are you talking about? And they say, well, let me tell you. And then at least three or four times in Acts chapter 4, they say, let me tell you about the name. Let me tell you about the name. All that's to say that eventually, as you invest in a person and you work through those first four things, it's going to come to the place, it needs to come to the place where you use words. Mm, amen. And you say, this is who Jesus is. And this is why I do what I do. And this is why you might be annoyed with me, right? This is why I don't do the things that you do. You don't do that first, right? If you do that first, then you probably fracture a relationship. But eventually you get there. And then the sixth thing is prayer. And I think it's, it's, it's overlooked. And these aren't necessarily like in a particular order, right? Um, there's some natural flow here, but in John 14... Jesus gives that big statement, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And, you know, one of the apostles says, you know, show us the way. I don't want to go to heaven. Show us the way. And Jesus says, I am the way. Follow me. He says, you want to do all the works that I do? And the apostles say, yeah, we want to do all the works that you do. And who wouldn't say that? I want to do the works of Jesus. And Jesus says, you're going to do greater works than I am. When you ask in my name, the world will change and people will come to be saved. That's what he says, paraphrased. One of the greatest ways you can invest is to pray for people specifically. Yeah. Um, one of the wisest professors I ever had was an ethics professor. And I'll never forget, and when he said it, I rolled my eyes initially. You know, my heart wasn't right. But I'll never forget, it's like, you know, 18, 19 years ago. He said, I want you to come up with five people, a few that you agree with and a few that you don't. Write their names down on a list and pray for them every day. Because what that is is an investment. And not only are you investing in them, you're investing in your own heart. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's such an overlooked way to invest. Like, who can you pray for? Like, who can you, on behalf of, go to the Father and say, hey, I agree with them, I love them, they need some help, they're going through this, or hey, their worldview is completely different from mine, and I need you to speak into this situation. We believe God answers those prayers. So you invest in time, talent, treasure, influence, but you also invest eventually in words. That ought to be the goal, to, to say something about Jesus, explicitly about the resurrection from the dead, the hope of the gospel, salvation that comes from him and him alone. And all that's covered in prayer. You know, something you made me think about there is, is that if I, if I think through that progression that I'm going to eventually get to words, mm. it holds me accountable to make that's sure right. that my time and my talent, my treasure are going to match that later. And I'm not going to look like a, a hypocrite, you right. know. Uh, and I wonder if that's what holds a lot of us back is oh, they saw me live like that, and now I'm going to tell them about Jesus. Yes. Now, that doesn't mean I have to be perfect, but it is good to hold, yes. hold myself accountable that eventually this person needs to know that I'm a Christian. Is that conversation going to be even more awkward sure. <laughs> when I get there? Well, words because matter, matter. don't they? You're not a part of a relationship where words don't matter. What you say matters. Yeah. Um, we're, we're, we're challenging one another, we're challenging our staff, speak out loud, like in the next couple of weeks, what your goals are for your ministry specifically in 2021. Because saying things out loud matters. You know, the last, we've said several times, you know, what we've done here over the last eight weeks or so, we know is not going to move the needle um, in great, gigantic ways. But us speaking these things out loud, when I say, hey, I, wanna, I, want, I want a group of young men who might one day want to preach a sermon and might one day want to get into the ministry and I want to spend time with them every month. If I don't do that in 2021 because I've spoken that out loud, it matters. Mm -hmm. And if I don't do that, then I, I'm not holding myself accountable. Mm -hmm. And so if your goal through your talent, not your career, through your talent and time and investment is to say something about Jesus in this relationship that you're praying for, eventually you're going to get there. Mm -hmm. I got real preachy there, sorry.
It's all right. Bring it. <laughs> so the last, last spot there, let's look at these. Let's get even more practical for the investing opportunities that College Side provides. Now, I don't want to sound arrogant when we say that, that here's what College Side does, but, but really what we mean is think of someone who comes this Sunday and says, I want to be a, a part of this family. Can you help me invest my time, talent, treasure, you know? What we want to see is eventually we're, we're seeing that individually. Hey, you do your thing in, in your community. You make disciples. You don't need College Side to have an organized ministry to help you do that. But the, you, we need both, don't we? Because College Side, as a family of believers, comes together and says, well, hey, come on, let me help you do this. And let's pool our resources. Let's do this together. So one of the first obvious ways, something that just happened today, that happens every Wednesday, is our, our Bread for Life ministry. We're pooling our resources, our time, our talents, and there are people who simply bag groceries, but there are people who simply teach the Word of God, too. And there's people that pray, and there's people that encourage and smile, and, and we're doing all that together, and all that comes together to do something awesome for Jesus. And, and so that's one example. You know, CR would be another example. And real easy to think about ministries like that where members can come together. And if that is, is an opportunity that would fit someone, we want to provide those kind of opportunities. Um, mentoring. So ministry opportunities, but I see mentoring as being something a little more specific. So in the heartfelt friends ministry, you know, with, with our ladies, there's a goal there for a woman who's a little further down the path of discipleship can take a younger woman and say, let me show you how I did it and show you how, what I learned and, and, uh, and we can glean from wisdom there. But, you know, in the UCSC with our campus ministry, we've always tried and, we've, and we're, we're doing this in a formal way, come help us mentor these college students and so we've got that. That's, that's discipleship. Uh, and I thought about Mother's Day Out. I mean, Mother's Day Out is a, is a tremendous way for kids to get into our presence. And then we have folks that come over. And in fact, Kathy uses a lot of our college students to, to teach. And so there's someone who's younger that can help a child, uh, as well as those who are a little further down the road. Um, our marriage ministry has been another spot for that where um, we have active mentoring and there's others that I'm sure I won't list uh, right now. Teaching is obviously a way to invest. And we talked about that six weeks ago or so. Um, and we want to, to do a better job about creating even that mentoring relationship and teaching. Um, but there are opportunities to invest all across the board in every age, in kids' side, in teen side, um, you know, on the adult level, uh, particularly on Sunday mornings, um, there are opportunities to teach. And so if you want to invest and you feel like, yeah, that's something I could do, maybe I'm not ready, well, there's certainly somebody that we can partner you with to do that. So that's, that's a way to invest as well. Two more. Uh, categorize these two differently, even though they're the same thing, really, but <clears throat> maybe it helps to think of an outreach effort that we do together, like the Northeast School outreach that we do there, or TTU, obviously, is a big outreach for us. Thinking about we're going out, outside of our walls, outside of our group, and we're reaching out. Uh, MANA, the, the MANA ministry that, that has... Uh, uh, Jeff and Jordan Reese, Chad and Jill Minat are, are heavily into that and leading that. Uh, the house that's across the street, if you don't know, the house that's on the corner right here has become our manna house. And our missions team and our shepherds decided that we would um, allow the manna team to train missionaries right there in that house. And then they have taken and out of their own resources have fixed that house up. And we're going to get a tour of that sometime soon, one of these days. Maybe a video tour would be great. 
But that's an outreach effort. They are making disciples. It's something that we are sending out. But then maybe what's good to then separate is what we're going to do. Now, we have planted churches out of this out of this church. This church was a church plant, and this church has planted churches, but what we're saying is we're going to plant churches. Yeah, and, and, and our hope is that, I, I'll just be honest with this, is not, you know, a confidential thought <laughs> uh, I've shared with several people. Um, conventional wisdom, you know, if you've, if you've called on to that term church plant, um, conventional wisdom says, hey, we're in COVID, right? We need to, we're in two assemblies. You know, we were 700 on Sunday mornings before COVID happened, and now we've got two assemblies. We've still got a lot of people who um, are home for health concerns, and we've got two assemblies, and conventional wisdom says what? It's the worst time to plant a church, right? We need to get, we need to get back together. We need to figure this thing out, you know, stabilize and all that, but I'll tell you, I, I, I'm starting to believe, and um, it might be the perfect time. Conventional wisdom doesn't always work. At minimum, a church plant, a new church in this town, in this general area, multiplies the opportunities by at least two. But really, it's more than that. Like, it doubles the opportunity for people to invest. It doubles the work, at the very least. And that's to say nothing of different demographics that are the goal or the vision of the group. And so uh, there's great energy and excitement. I'm talking about empirical research and data has been collected by people who have planted churches. And not only is it good for a church plant, it's good for the mother church in terms of energy and excitement and ministry engagement. Um, And so you're going to hear more and more about that. It might be, it might not be, but it might be the perfect time to do that. So it's going to be a way at some point we believe that you can invest in some way, regardless of if you are a part of a church plant or not. We appreciate your attention, your, your, your engagement, and what we've been doing. I uh, hope this has been helpful. We will, in the new year, we're going to start a workshop in here on discipleship. We're going to talk about discipleship for the first several weeks up leading up to spring break. And so we'll really break things down and move through and think about personal growth, personal discipleship, disciplines, and such. And then, so we'll expand upon the bullet points and really think about how, how we can and, and in our own personal growth.